morning cap city isn't that good news amen right well welcome uh my name is tom Bryan. i have the privilege of serving as an elder here we're so glad that you're joining us this morning uh my wife showed us the schedule for the week and uh i need a moment okay so if you're like our family you know this week is packed with wonderful things as we uh, get ready for Christmas. Just eight days away, my daughter reminded me this morning. Um, 
So it's an opportunity, as we do every week, just to kind of take a deep breath, kind of calm ourselves, uh, prepare ourselves for this morning's service to allow the Lord to work in our hearts. Um, so I'll give you some time here just to personally uh, take a breath and confess, and then I'll pray, and then we'll confess together as a church body, okay? Father God, we take a moment this morning just to uh, come before your throne uh, humbly. Holy Spirit, we invite you here this morning. We ask that you be moving amongst your people, ministering to the needs that are here this morning. God, we thank you for uh, this Advent season as we celebrate the coming of Jesus. Father, help us to enjoy this time. Help us to um, focus on thanksgiving as we celebrate your son. Lord, help us not to forget that he came to die for us. And that's the good news, Father. And we thank you. We ask now that as you've heard our personal confession, Lord, hear our corporate confession as a church body. Let's confess together. God of grace and truth, in Jesus Christ, you came among us as light shining in darkness. We confess that we have not welcomed the light or trusted the good news to be good. We have closed our eyes to the glory in our midst, expecting little and hoping for less. As we celebrate your coming to earth in human form, forgive our debt and renew our hope so that we may receive the fullness of your grace and live in the truth of Christ the Lord. Amen.
You can take a seat. This third Advent candle we light is the pink candle. There are various traditions as to why this candle is pink, but they all reflect the idea that joy comes through Jesus' arrival and through the salvation he has gifted us. This is not a happiness similar to receiving a gift, but is it a deeper happiness that a person automatically experiences because of certain favorable circumstances, and it cannot be deterred by present circumstances. This type of joy comes from God alone. Romans chapter 15 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy. We cannot will ourselves to experience joy. It comes from God. In Galatians chapter 5, it communicates that joy is is a fruit of the Spirit. We experience more joy as we spend time with God and allow him to fill us with joy. In John 16, scripture reiterates that this joy is given to us by God himself and that no one has the ability to rob us of our joy. No matter what circumstances we encounter, no one can take this away. We light the candle of joy in celebration of Christ's first coming to satisfy God's wrath against humanity's sin but we also anticipate his return to take us home 
to be with him. Because of these realities, we can have joy in every circumstance. Today's scripture is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 1 through 4 and verse 10. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord. The majesty of our God, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those have, who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance with the repentance of God. He will come and save you. And the ransoms of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy. And sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us joy that is not determined by our circumstances. Forgive us when we lose sight of the realities of the coming of Jesus and help us rest in your great joy this Christmas season that is dependent on the work you have already completed and is not based on what's happening in our lives, in our world, or the people that we are with. Remind us that true joy comes from no earthly thing but from you alone. Thank you for the gift that you have given us that first Christmas in Jesus' arrival. Flood our hearts with joy this Advent season as we reflect on the good news of Jesus' birth, death, and resurrection. It's in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen.
God, we praise you, we worship you, and we lift your name high. God, we celebrate your birth in just eight days. And God, we have celebrated together as a church the anticipation of that birth. God, as we approach your birthday, I pray that we would also look forward as a church in anticipation, God, to Easter, to the reason you were born. God, that you would prepare our hearts to welcome you next week. But God, bigger than that, you prepare our hearts to welcome you into each one of our lives as we approach your death and resurrection this spring. God, that you would stir within us as a church, God, as individuals, as families. God, a deepened desire to know you, to know your word. And God, to follow you and trust you. God, I just invite you here today, invite you here this morning. God, that you would do a mighty work in each one of our hearts as we hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would stay standing for a minute, please. Good morning, Capital City Church. It's an interesting time of year. I always think that Christmas is uh, it's a fascinating idea because God can't be born and God can't die or else he's not God. So God was not born in the manger and God did not die on the cross, but God became flesh. So what do we do with that? Like, how do we, it's a conundrum. I, we, we, I almost feel like the limitation is in our language. Like, we don't know how to talk about it because it's real. It really happened. God became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's such a unique and odd thing in the course of human history. It's a one-off. So, of course, we're going to subdivide how we count years, right? It kind of splits time in half. Of course. It's a seminal moment for us. We're going to read Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. It says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. Jesus was of the house and lineage of David. Jesse was David's father. So it's actually really meaningful that it says there from the stump of Jesse because you would think it would say from the stump of David. Because all of David's descendants were talked about that way. So it's almost as if Isaiah was saying he is equal than David. He's equal to David. He's better than David. He's a new David. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and, what does the word say? It means discernment. Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge, very fascinating statement, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And then, I mean, this is kind of odd, let's be honest. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips she, he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The, what does it say? Wolf. Not the lion, which is what we all think, right? The lion lays down with the lamb. Actually, the verse says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together, 
and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. And this is kind of the summary of the whole thing. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. I love this phrase. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. We are in a sermon series called Sounds of the Season. We're kind of using these Christmas hymns, these Christmas carols as jumping off points to uh, discover uh, the imagery behind them uh, as uh, might be expected, or at least I think it's fairly predictable. Uh, when you want to tackle a subject like this, when you want to address a subject like this through this lens, um, we're going to trend towards some older uh, songs. Uh, we sang a song earlier today, which is our jumping off point for today, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, right? Which actually traces its roots all the way back to the 800s, which is the reason that it sounds a little different. And it's very plaintive and it's very reflective, right? Um, it reminded me, as, as I unpacked this idea, I was reminded of a much newer Christmas song that you're probably familiar with. In 1991, we were blessed with the song, Mary, Did You Know? Is everybody familiar with Mary, Did You Know? Okay, here we go. It's a social experiment. How many people in here love the song, Mary, Did You Know? Raise your hands high. Represent. Be proud. Okay, hey, all right. Watch this. How many people in here hate the song, Mary, Did You Know? Quite a, more than you would think, right? Because, and some of you right now, you're saying, why in the world would you hate it? What, what could possibly taint the soul of a person that would hate this song? Some of you are thinking that right now. And you know what that tells me about you? You're not on social media. Because I am still flabbergasted at the arguments over this song. I heard it right after it came out. Uh, actually written by Mark Lowry, which I think is the most intriguing thing about the song. If you know who that is, he's like this Christian comedian who also has an amazing voice. Uh, but he wrote this song. Uh, he's super funny. Like, how did you come up with that? I guess it's just it's creativity, right? So the idea of the song is the speaker having this, you know, imaginary conversation with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and saying, did you know that your son was going to do this? And did you know that your son was going to do that? And did you know that your son was going to be this? And did you know your son was going to be that, right? Fascinating idea, because down, deep down inside of it, which this, this is our pivot point for what we're going to talk about today. Down inside this song is this idea of expectations and wondering and potential, like, if this, in, in, you know, use your imagination with me. Imagine that you didn't have 2,000 years, the last 2,000 years of recorded history. Like, if you were there in the moment, it might be fascinating to know that here is this child. Even if you had some understanding of the significance of this child, you might not totally know everything that was coming, right? So uh, here's my official stance on Mary, did you know? <laughs> Not that nobody asked, right? Did she know? Are you ready? Kind of. <laughs> kind of. She knew some of it. Uh, you know, broadly speaking, I mean, if you read the Magnificat in Luke 1, clearly she knew a lot. But did she know all of the details of what he would do? Probably not. Because every single thing that he did wasn't foretold. And yet this idea of who, I, I don't think she was shocked by anything that she saw. Maybe human, humanly speaking she was. And yet Mary had this understanding as only a mama can, right? Of, of what's, what's happening here and what's the potential here. Uh, what is the unknown potential or what is the known potential? And yet, are you ready for this? I'm... I'm going to jump to the last slide. I didn't tell them I was going to do this. 
I'm going to read these, this, the lyrics that you just uh, sang. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, this passage in Isaiah was written. 700 years. So yeah, when he came, there was some kind of understanding by folks who were educated and read in and who were kind of paying attention, right? And so thinking about these verses that we just read in Isaiah 11, now listen to the lyrics that you sang just a few minutes ago. O come, O come, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. Which, by the way, is a representation of all of us. This wasn't just about Israel. It's about all of us. All of us who have now been grafted into this story as believers. That mourns in lonely exile here. This, wasn't a, this is not a political statement. This is much bigger than that. It's about imbalances of power. It's about there not being justice. That can get pretty fresh for you and I, can't it? Because we see that right now. And could I just say this to you? And you hear me say this type of thing all the time. You'll hear me make comments about our culture, our culture, our culture. It's not just our culture. It's every culture. Anywhere that humans exist, there are going to be imbalances of power. There's going to be evil. This is what humanity brings to the table. This is what we decided to inject into the story. This wasn't God's idea. This is our idea. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Why? Because when the Son of God appears, things are going to change. Things are going to change. Put a pin in that. We're going to come back to it. Rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Here we go. O come thou, rod of Jesse. This is the imagery from Isaiah 11. Free thine own from Satan's tyranny. This ultimately is the problem. It's our sin, and it's our enemy who goes around wreaking havoc. I was listening to a, a podcast, it's a Christian podcast, and they bring up this idea of why would Satan attack? Like, what's the end game if Satan attacks someone? Like, what does he gain from it? And my first thought was, you're missing the point. He doesn't have to gain anything. Spreading misery and suffering is his game. Right? This is what he wants to bring to the story. Free thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save and give them victory o'er the grave. Rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. But not just to Israel, also to you and to me. So, that was the Jesus that was born. That was the child that showed up. And maybe Mary didn't understand the specifics, and maybe everything that Jesus would do, every miracle that he performed, was not foretold in literal detail. But this was a significant child. See, with Jesus, there were multiple prophecies, and this is very interesting, and I want you to catch this, and some of you have been in church a long time, and maybe you've never thought about this before. Maybe you have, but it's likely that you haven't thought about this before. There were multiple prophecies about Jesus that began being fulfilled when he was born, but actually won't come to complete fulfillment until he returns. And so we can read these prophecies and say things like, this is the nuance, which is, you know, when you have a song like Mary, Did You Know? This, by the way, listen, this is what makes it ripe for an internet argument. Because when we argue on the internet, there is no nuance. None of us have nuance. We're all just insane. <laughs> it's like we're all living in our mom's basement, and, <laughs> right? We go crazy. And yet there is actual nuance in life. And this idea that Jesus, so when we, when we ask, did Jesus bring justice? Well, yes, but not completely. The, I mean, the very fact, the, the way that he died was unjust. 
and yet it was necessary. And we could go right down the list. It has this pro- was this prophecy fulfilled at Jesus' birth? Well, yeah, kind of. We got, we got glimpses of it. We got to see it a little bit. And yet it will be fully fulfilled at his future second coming. So let's look at three very quick observations from uh, this passage. And we'll uh, kind of step through this. And I'll go ahead and warn you, like the first one's really long because it sets the stage for the others, okay? So don't think that we're going to be here all afternoon with how long it takes me to unpack this first one. This is in your notes. You're taking notes along with us, hopefully. Um, Jesus, the first observation, Jesus is filled with discernment to bring true justice. He is filled with discernment to bring true justice. Listen, go back with me to verse 2 of Isaiah 11. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And I told you when I read it, understanding actually means what? Discernment, that's right. The spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. uh, This is so huge. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. Listen, that's what we do, and that's not because we're evil, it's because that's all we have to work with. How do you decide if this is just or unjust? Well, I need to see everything that I can see. I need to hear everything that I can hear. I need to discover everything I can discover. And then we bring some version of justice. And by the way, listen up. No matter where you are kind of on the spectrum of how you like relate to God, like some of you are believers and some of you are not sure and some of you are sure that you're not a believer, right? No matter where you are on that spectrum, we all can get behind the idea of there being justice. Like we want there to be justice. Here's the catch. We don't all agree on what justice looks like, do we? We all agree with the idea that there should be justice. And some of us get upset when there's not justice. In fact, some of you, and I'm one of those people, some of us get abnormally upset at the idea of injustice. Like it really bothers us. And we really want to take action. And man, I just can't stand a bully. I'm just telling you. It's something about the way I'm wired. I'm sure there's some sin mixed in there that makes it worse, right? But there's just, there's something natural in me that if I see you bullying somebody else, I want to come find you. It's not right. And yet, you may think to yourself, well, I'm not sure that's what justice looks like. Exactly. We all love the idea, but we don't all agree on the implications and the applications and kind of the confrontations of justice. And part of the reason is, all we have to work with is what our eyes see and what our ears hear. And that's not always going to bring us perfect justice, because in order for there to be perfect justice, you have to really understand everything that's going on. So I mentioned podcasts earlier. I'm a, a little bit of a history nerd, and that is to say, take out the little bit part, I'm just a history nerd, right? So one of the things I love to do if I'm working in my, in my workshop is I'll turn on a podcast and, I'll, and like the longer the better then because I'm, I'm doing something else. So I'm just also kind of listening in. And so there's a, there's a history podcast called American Scandal. It's a very interesting podcast. And what first drew me to it actually was they did a multi-part. So it was several, they have what they call episodes and each episode's maybe an hour or so. So they have multiple episodes and it was about Watergate. Well, I wasn't even alive when Watergate happened, and yet, loving American history and American presidential history, it's a very fascinating thing. And, and I kind of go into these going, I, I mean, I wasn't a history major in high school or, or college or graduate school. I'm just a nerd. So when I hear somebody talk about these things, generally speaking, I've heard all of this. But this is a really interesting podcast because in every episode as they unpack it, I go, oh, actually, that's new information. Listen, look at me. Listen to the title of it, American Scandal. Every, like every episode circles around this idea that everyone was thinking one way, because this is how scandals work. Everyone was thinking one way, and then the curtain is pulled back, and there's all this new information, and everybody goes, oh my gosh, I had no idea. Well, I was thinking he was great, 
and now he's the devil, right? Or I thought that that was fair, but it's 100% unfair and unjust. Like, that's the hook of the podcast. And yet, scandals are real. And the point of a scandal is when the hidden becomes known, it changes the way we think. Listen to me and look at me and make some connections with me. It changes the way we think about justice. It changes the way we think about justice. And inevitably, come on, lean into this with me. No matter where you are on the spectrum of relating to God, all of us can agree about this. There have been times in our lives where we've said, you know, if I had known that before, I would have thought differently. That's the point of the podcast. We're giving you new information. Or they're rewinding it to those points in American history where the new information came out and suddenly everyone changed their minds about something. That bothers us. That bothers us. Because our lens for justice can evolve and change, and I put this in your notes because I think it's important. Maybe you've never thought about this. Maybe you have. I don't know. But I think it's important for us to say things like this out loud. Often popular or accepted justice is also imperfect justice. Why? Because we don't have the whole story. I don't know. Something could come out next week or next year or 10 years from now, and in 100 years, they're going to have a podcast and say, and then the the story broke. (laughs) And then the news came out. And all of a sudden, everyone heard more of the truth. Why? Because, listen to me, human judgment, even on our best days, even with our best people, Human judgment will always ultimately be incomplete. This is why Jesus said in John 7, 24, do not judge by appearances, but judge with what? Everybody say it out loud. Now, if you and I had the power to make a pact that from this point forward, anyone, including actual judges, but anyone in a position of authority had no choice but to act with right judgment. First of all, they would have it. And second of all, they would be so dedicated to it that they would always act on it. Would the world be a better place? We would all think differently about judgment, wouldn't we? That's actually a great statement. Judge with right judgment. The problem is we don't have right judgment. And we're often not dedicated. If we did have it, I'm not convinced we would all act on it. Ecclesiastes 1.8, which, which is the Old Testament echo, or maybe Jesus' statement is the echo from this, right? The eye is not, what does the word say? Satisfied. Satisfied. Listen, what it doesn't mean is the eye is not happy. It's not that kind of satisfaction. What it means is the eye has not been provided with adequate information. The eye can't see everything there is to see. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Listen, this is the pivot point. No matter what you believe about God, I think we can all agree. That's not how justice is supposed to work. We take our best stab at it. But then if we get new information or something new comes to light, we all have to pivot. We all have to change, whether it's a minor change or a complete 180. Justice shouldn't be evolving. Authentic justice, this is in your notes, should be as immutable as God himself. Listen, if you were accused of a heinous crime and you were taken to court, would you want real justice to happen? Especially if you're innocent. Wouldn't you want real justice to happen? Wouldn't you welcome it? What if I told you, hey, listen, I know how this story ends. They're not going to get it right initially. But over time, more information is going to come out more. And eventually, true justice is going to come. What would you think to yourself? Some of you know people who have literally lived this story. And you think to yourself, yeah, but 
We want to see perfect justice up front. Not eventually, not later. And so we arrive at the conclusion that Jesus is the only real source and the true arbiter of biblical justice. Which is why we read in Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. He's the only one who's going to get it right. Why? Listen. Because he's the only one who has all the information. In order to truly bring justice, you have to know what actually happened, not someone's event, uh, version of events of what actually happened. You have to know what actually happened, not because you saw the security footage, but because you're present everywhere all at once. You have to know what intention was. Listen, look at me, because you can read hearts and minds and motives. We're never going to get to true justice if somebody doesn't have that access. Well, let's, kind of being silly, let's make a list of all the people who have that kind of access. Jesus, (coughs) anybody have anybody else that goes, no, it's just him. So yes, God exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Why? Because he's unlike every other person. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. My old New American Standard mind, which is the version that I read and preached from for years, says at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Which is actually what's going to happen. Not the people who like him. And it's not the people who agree with him. And it's not the people who are in the mood. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christos estu curios. Jesus Christ is Lord. He's the king. He's bringing justice. Perfect, true justice. I call it biblical justice because now, especially in our culture, in this cultural moment that we find ourselves in, we talk about all different kinds of justice, right? We have all these qualifiers, social justice or other kinds of justice. But as I've done with other things, I'm not running away from the idea of justice and I'm not going to not use this word because it's, there's a misunderstanding. We're going to use it and we're going to define it. Why? Because perfect justice belongs to God. And this is part of what he's called you and I to help usher in. Not what you think justice should be, or not what I think justice should be, but as his followers, as followers of this Lord, to the glory of God the Father, by the way, that's what real justice does, it glorifies God. By the way, this moment that's being described here, when every knee shall bow, every knee's going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess, listen, This is not a description of when it's forced. It's it's a description of when it becomes so obvious to everyone that we have no choice but to go, okay. We all thought we were right. But in this moment, it's really vivid. Who's Lord? So wouldn't it be really useful if we could know ahead of time what that moment's going to look like? Wouldn't it be really useful if we could know ahead of time what his views are? Wouldn't it be really useful if we could know ahead of time what his views are and begin to align our lives with what those views are? Because we believe in spite of this justice and that justice and that person back there and over here there's a miscarriage of justice. We ultimately know because we've been told and because we believe it. We ultimately know that real justice is coming. And I want to live every day between here and that day. I want to live for that day. And I want to reorient myself for that day. Please hear me. This is the calling of a disciple. As a disciple, 
You are called to some things. In fact, in January, we're going to launch a sermon series where we're going to help you. We've been working hard on this this year. The elders and I and Pastor Aaron, we've been working hard on this. Defining what does it mean when you come to Capital City Church, we're not just going to say, hey, you're called to be a disciple. That's true. But what does that mean? And I'll give you a little sneak peek. One of the things that it means for you, if you're a disciple, is that you're called to be a faithful neighbor. You've already heard me using that language. We're just going to keep using it. You're called to be a faithful neighbor. You know why I think you should come up here Friday night and go caroling with us? Because that's what faithful neighbors do. Well, I'm not in the mood, and I don't like to sing. And Right, okay, if you could, for just one second, hit pause on all that. Maybe it's about the people that we're singing to. This is what faithful neighbors do. I know, like, I get it. You, I, I wasn't supposed to say that because you've got other stuff you've got to do. Like, I, I do understand that, right? But being a faithful neighbor is not about me or how I feel or what consumer mentality I'm in at the moment. It's about bringing justice. And true biblical justice does, isn't always scary and frightening and, oh, my goodness, what, like, what are we going to do? How are we going to? No, it we're going to circle back to this at the end. We delight in it. We delight in seeing the justice of God come because God is good and He loves us. We want to see that happen. So we're going to live as faithful neighbors. In fact, this is in your notes. Being a faithful neighbor means treating others as God calls us to in light of this biblical justice. We treat others the way that God has called us to, which means we do good to them, and we bless them, and we let them know that we care about them, and that begins by actually caring about them. We don't just let them know we care about them. We genuinely do care about them. And, please hear this, at times we may be called to say things that they not, may not particularly like. Not because God calls us to be militant culture warriors, but because he calls us to be faithful to true justice. What do love and justice require of me? That's the question. The requirement is that we're called to help people experience God's love in tangible and ultimately benevolent ways. So Jesus is filled with discernment to bring true justice. Very quickly, the second thing. He is all-powerful to execute His will. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this. We kind of have already touched on it, right? He's all-powerful to execute His will. The second half of verse 4. This is that weird phrase, right? He shall strike the earth with the rod of His mouth, and with the breath of His lips He shall kill the wicked. Is that like really bad breath or <laughs> some kind of halitosis? What are we talking about here? This, this is strange imagery. Alex Mocher says this in his commentary on Isaiah, which I think really brings this into focus for us. The king needs no other display of power and no other weapon of enforcement than the bare word that he speaks. And so without lifting a finger. Tim, do you have a precedent for this? Yes, the creation story. Without lifting a finger, he speaks justice into existence. And so, yes... He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. He doesn't need an actual rod, just with his words. It will shake the earth. And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked, right? In Genesis 1, in the creation account, God speaks the world into existence. There are eight different times in Genesis 1 where it says God said, and then something happened. In Revelation, this is what I love about this. Listen to the bookends. you got Genesis 1. And then you've got Revelation 19. Jesus is going to speak perfect and permanent justice in Revelation 19. He'll speak it into existence. He spoke the creation into existence. We've kind of done our work on creation, which has been not good. This is what humans brought to the equation. In the end, true justice comes. God's final plan is fully put into action just from the words of his mouth. Psalm 115.3. I just threw this in there because I think it's a fascinating verse. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. 
He just does it. And sometimes he allows things to happen that we don't understand and we don't like. And sometimes injustice comes and sometimes injustice stays. And not in any way to overshadow that or belittle that. But man, we look to the end when we know that true justice comes and all the wrongs are made right. The last observation from Isaiah 11 about Jesus. I love this. His eternal reign will bring eternal peace. He's coming. He's bringing justice with Him. And ultimately what that's going to mean when there's true justice, you get true peace. That's how it works. You only have peace in the presence of justice. And you get all these verses, uh, 6 through 9, right? You've got all this imagery of wolves and lambs laying down together and leopards with young goats, right? The calf and the lion, fatted calf. There's a little kid leading them all, right? What in the world could all of this mean? Well, as I told you when we were reading it, it's really summed up in the second half of verse 9. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. Listen, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Could I just tell you this? I think this is one of the core, core, core reasons for the existence of the local church. It's our job in our little sphere to bring to fruition to those around us the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We are forerunners of that coming kingdom, right? And as we begin to, to usher in, many times we're subversive, like everyone doesn't understand what we're doing. We're forerunners. We're behind enemy lines, and we're bringing God's kingdom to fruition. What does that look like? The earth being full of the knowledge of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. The earth shall, walk through it with me, the earth shall, which means this is certain, it's going to happen, it shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. This could literally be translated, it'll be full of knowing the Lord. There will not be one part of the earth where the Lord is not fully known and fully understood for who He is. As the waters cover the sea, which is, you know, that's an odd phrase. Well, water fills the sea to the fullness of its capacity. It's going to be saturated. The earth is going to be saturated. I'm telling you, listen, this is not some kind of mystical out there. We won't re- it'll be true, but we won't really know that it's true, but only those who have eyes to see. No, this is going to be reality. God, this, there's going to come a day in God's creation where this is true where the earth is full and everyone in the earth are full of the knowledge of the understanding of who God is. And it's going to saturate everything and everyone. So what's our response? Because let's be honest, when we talk about justice, we all get a little nervous, right? Remember I said earlier, like if you were taken to court and accused of something, how would you respond? What would you want to be true? I guarantee you, every one of you thought in, your, in the back of your minds, well, I don't know, did I do it? Like, am I guilty or am I not guilty? If I'm going to court, I want to know. Look at me. Because we all have those moments that we don't like. Those moments that we wish we could go back and change. It's that night, it's that weekend. It's that spring break trip. You took a job that you wish you could go back and change because of things that happened and decisions that you made coming out of that. It's a relationship that you have with someone you wish you could go back and do things differently. If I gave you a do-over, most of us know, like I know, I would go back and do, I would do this differently. Because this is our story. And so with the idea of true justice coming, where the earth is saturated and we can't escape it. Does that make us nervous? Like, what should our response be to the idea that true justice is coming? Should we tremble and quake? As God's children, 
as believers in Jesus Christ, we don't have to. And so, I love this. Psalm 98, verses 7 through 9. In fact, I'm going to read this to you, and then in a few minutes, we're going to take a minute and you're going to pray. And this is actually going to be kind of the, the skeleton, the framework of what we're going to pray today is Psalm 97, verses 7 through 9. Listen to this imagery. Check it out. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. See if this doesn't sound like the earth being covered with the knowledge of the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. What great imagery. Now I know where Rich Mullins got it, right? Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. Why are we singing? Why are we clapping our hands? Why are we excited? Why are we responding with joy? Why are we roaring? Why, 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 why? Listen. For he comes to judge the earth. Even in light of your worst moment, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, you still get to rejoice at the idea that he's coming to bring judgment. Because his judgment is good and true and righteous. And because we've put our faith in Jesus Christ, We've already been judged. And we've been found righteous. Not because we are righteous, but because this baby that was born in the manger, right? He ultimately went to the cross, not for his own sin, but for yours. And when you put your faith in that, you have the opportunity, in fact, it is a certainty, when you put your faith in that, what happens is your sinfulness is traded for Jesus' righteousness. You say, Tim, I'm not righteous. I know. Your spouse told me. <laughs> your kids, uh, no, look, I know you're not righteous. And you're a work in progress, like I get it. And it breaks our hearts when we still sin, right? And yet, look at me, positionally speaking, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, the invitation's open. You get to do that. The invitation won't always be open. There will come a day when the invitation's that it's over. The door's closed. But in the meantime, anyone and everyone can come through the door. The door's Jesus. So yeah, we can rejoice at the idea of true justice finally coming. That we get the chance to see justice manifested. We do all this for he comes to judge the earth. Here we go. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. He's going to get it right. How do you know that? Because he's God. That's what God does. So our prayer from this, we're going to take just a minute. Our prayer from this is simple. It's something like this. God, help me see the world through your eyes. Help me see justice through your eyes. And help me to respond appropriately. Help me to adjust myself. In other words, see, check this out. Listen, I want to give you this imagery and then I'm going to let you put it in your own words to God. What we want to do is Find out from God, like, what does real justice look like in each and every situation? In my life, in my home, in my workplace, in my community. God, what is real? Like, you're the only one who knows, because the rest of us all have these incomplete viewpoints. God, what does real justice look like? Help me see that and understand that. Help me to see the world through your eyes. And then help me to adjust myself accordingly. Please hear me. Because your tendency and my tendency, our default, is that we want, to adjust, uh, we want to adjust the truth to our own preference. We call that spin. That's not real justice. It's not your version or your spin on it. 
God, what does true justice look like? And, and what does it look like for me to readjust myself, to reorient myself based on that idea? So we're going to take just a minute. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. Just a minute. Pray that prayer to God. God, we thank you for the promise that true justice will come. Uh, we pray now for your grace in our lives, that you would open our eyes and give us the faith to see the reality of that, the implications of that. For those of us in the room who have put our faith in Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins on the cross, flood us with your peace. The peaceful understanding that we can welcome justice, we can rejoice with the hills and the seas at the idea that Jesus is coming to bring justice. For those of us in the room who have not done that, open our eyes to see the reality of what's coming. Give us saving faith to respond to that sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. <clears throat> For all of us in the room, give us the faith to trust your distribution of justice, your application of justice at the right time, in the right way, to the right people. And I pray in our lives, we would be able to see in very real and tangible ways the earth filling up with the knowledge of the Lord, even as the waters cover the sea. So we thank you for Jesus and for his justice, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Will you come to bring peace, to be loved, to be nearer to us? Will you come to bring light, to be light, to shine?
I love this time of year, not because I'm a pastor, just because I think it's fascinating rhythm that we find ourselves in, that once a year we kind of stop everything, right, to celebrate, and yeah, I get it, not everybody knows why they're celebrating, and you know, some of us are just looking for an excuse to watch Home Alone for the 147th time, which I love, by the way, it's a fantastic movie. Uh, do we miss the point? Sure, absolutely. But man, oh man, the idea that God became flesh. And so I want to pray for you. This is not the benediction. It's just I find it more and more kind of my heart's cry. Like the, the purpose of the church. Why do we exist? We could fill up multiple whiteboards answering that question with right answers, by the way. But I think we may miss one of the big ones. We're the bride of Christ. And it is our job. It's our calling to be in love with Jesus. We're his bride. And so in light of all the other stuff, right? I say this all the time, right? When someone's getting married and I'm doing marital counseling, premarital counseling, somebody's getting married, I always say this to the bride because she's the one that's like, everything has to be perfect and all the details and the flowers and what if somebody faints and what if we drop the ring and listen, you got to have me and a piece of paper. That's what makes you married. <laughs> everything else is details. But this is what I always say, listen, don't forget to enjoy your wedding. In light of all the other stuff, right? Don't forget to enjoy the wedding. Because it's fun. It's a celebration. And if the third guy from the right faints, that's just a memory. <laughs> that's what we're, we're going to say for years. Remember when Joe fainted and we all laughed at him, and right? Don't forget to enjoy your wedding. Can I just say to you as the bride of Christ, don't forget to enjoy your Savior. And so when we gather, we just want to love Jesus. And coming out of that, being faithful neighbors, tomorrow night, we've got a gingerbread bash that's happening. And all of our kids are invited, and I think a bunch of them are coming. This is a, a, an experience for kids and for families, you know? But we've also tried to spread the word far and wide into our community. You know why? Because this is kind of what faithful neighbors do. We just want to bless just want to bless people. 
help them to have a great Christmas. And we don't want to shove Jesus down anybody's throat, but we do want to say, hey, there's a reason for this season, right? So if you're a part of that, could I just challenge you? When you walk in this place tomorrow, think in terms of a faithful neighbor. Ask God when you're driving here. What kind of church might we be if we all prayed that prayer with fervor as we were driving here to do anything? God, make me a faithful neighbor today. Friday night, we're going to come up here and we're going to carol. It's not too late. If you want to do that, come talk to Eric. My family's coming. We're going to sing loud and off key. (laughs) Does that work? So... I was actually thinking about this yesterday when we were looking at the list of people that are signed up to carol. Like, if you watch every movie, Christmas movie, at the end, they all carol, right? Like, tons of them. How many of those movies, everybody's singing perfectly? It doesn't happen. In fact, usually the stars, like, are completely tone deaf. But they're there, smiling, holding a candle, singing, handing Joyful out Joyful noise, baby. Come on and sing yeah. with us. If you can, listen, I know you've got other stuff. I'm not, I wasn't trying to make anybody feel guilty earlier. I know genuinely you have other commitments. You can't come. <laughs> no condemnation. I grew up in legalism. I'm not interested in that anymore, right? Uh, if you can be here, though, just, you know, come hang out with us, and we're going to have some cocoa afterwards. Uh, if you can sing next Sunday, also making a joyful noise. Uh, in the choir. We're going to have a choir next week for our Christmas uh, Eve service. So uh, come be a part of that. Uh, Come up and talk to Eric about either of those things. The last thing, and then I'll give you the benediction. Uh, We've talked about our Christmas offering. I just want to remind you, um, this is uh, really intended to fund our future of church planting. Our goal is $50,000. So if you can pray about how you can give towards that, Uh, We want to establish a scholarship fund for men and women who want to go attend seminary uh, so that we can at least help. We're not going to pay everyone's way, but we can provide some help offset some of those costs. And then we want to start a pastoral residency. I hope to see it started next year. Um, By the way, if you think you might be called to pastoral ministry, you need to come find me and we need to go grab a coffee. Because churches are dying all around us. You know why they're dying? There's no pastors. You can't call the seminary and say, hey, send me a pastor. That's, those days are gone. And so great churches are withering and dying because they lose their pastor and they don't know what to do beyond that. We should do something about it. All of this under the guise of faithful neighbors. So our benediction for today. As we enter faithful neighbor week, may you remember this week that Emmanuel came to ransom Israel and all of creation from the captivity of injustice. May you join the seas and the rivers and the hills in rejoicing and singing for joy before the Lord in anticipation of His coming to judge the earth with righteousness and equity, never forgetting that God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Thanks for coming. Hope you have a great week. You're dismissed.